Amen. Before you're seated, just find a few people, just say good morning to them, give them a little high five, maybe a fist bump, maybe a hug. Go ahead and do that this morning. If you will, if you will, if you take your Bibles or your tablet or your iPhone, and if you just remain standing, we're going to get right into God's Word this morning. Philippians chapter 4, if you would please stand with me as we read God's Word, as we honor His holy and fallible Word that has all the answers to any problem or situation that you and I may face today. What we may face, what may be ahead of us, what we may be actually in right now at this very moment. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. Look what the God's word says this morning. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It should be on the screen if you don't have your Bible this morning. Look what it says. It says, rejoice. It's a great word. Rejoice. Rejoice if your team wins. Rejoice if your team loses. Rejoice if you're a Jaguars fan. Just rejoice, right? That's what, point blank. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness, another word for gentleness would be graciousness, be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Have you ever met someone you just immediately say, that person is just gracious? Would that be said about you? That person is just gracious. I don't know, I don't know about you, but for me, I've met some Christians and just by meeting them, I don't know that I don't want to be one. Mean, cancerous, critical, fault-finding. He says, let your gentleness, your graciousness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now say this with me. Be anxious for nothing. Say that with me. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, you let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God. I don't know about you, but I'd like to have a little bit more of that, wouldn't you? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Does it make sense? When your life's in a spin, when your life's out of control, when the storms of life are hitting you one wave after another, you just can't get your footing, and you have a peace. And people are like, what? I don't understand how you're keeping it all together. And you say, oh, I don't either. It's something supernatural. It's, it's what Paul's talking about right now when he says this. Did you know that Paul is writing this from a prison cell. He, he's chained up right now, and he's writing these words. Let the peace of God pass all understanding. Will it guard, protect, watch over, kind of like how the fighting Christians guarded the second half and we won that football game Friday night? I pray that they can do the same thing to the mighty conquerors of Trinity Christian Academy this Friday night. All right, I'm getting some of you already anxious, so let me stop. Will it will guard, protect, it will watch over. Look what the Bible says. Your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Would you help me preach this morning? Would you turn to two or three in case one's unresponsive and tell them you're anxious for nothing. Tell them. Go ahead. You're anxious for nothing. You may be seated. I believe in church there should be some responsive preaching. I think there should be some response. Sometimes we go to a ball game and we scream our heads off and we act like a fool. And some of you were probably doing that yesterday when the Florida Gators got beat by the Vanderbilt Commodores. How in the world that happened, I don't know. But you acted like a fool in the house, but you come to the house of God and sometimes we get all reserved and quiet. We, there should be some response, and so uh, I always enjoy hearing other people share just to kind of keep you awake and keep you moving this morning. I want, to, I want you to think about this thought. Why am I so anxious? Why am I so anxious? As we begin this holiday season and next, for the next 30 some odd days, um, you, you either are going to be in one of these two boats, you're going to be in the boat of anxiety because you got all this stuff you have to do, or you're going to be in the boat of thankfulness. But I have found in my own life, and maybe it's just me, maybe it's not you, but when I'm really anxious, 
I, I can't be at peace and be thankful. I find myself at times getting anxious about nothing, and I can't be thankful for something. And so in this season, our lives get a little chaotic. Like some of you are right now thinking about you're going to have to spend time with people you don't really enjoy being around <laughs> over the next few days. A few years ago, they, they, you know, they used to say you don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics. Well, now we've added another one. Don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics, and don't talk about the shot, you know, the COVID, the vid, the, the jab. You don't talk about that. It gets everybody all in, in one bank or the other, on one side or the other. And so just the, thinking about having to clean the house and get the house ready and have all these people over at your house and a house full of people is something you don't enjoy spending time with and all the stress and all that can take place and, and, then, and then the food. And for some of you ladies who don't enjoy cooking, the food part stresses you out. So some of you today would say, Rob, I wasn't anxious at all until you, until you started talking about all the things I got to do this week. And now I'm feeling a little anxious. But I found in my life that in this season over the next, you know, four weeks or so, 30 some odd days, we, we sometimes struggle to just hit the pause button and just be thankful because we're so anxious and all the pressure of all the things going on in our life can bring us to a place where we can't be thankful but we find ourselves in a state of anxiety reminds me of a story a little girl they're having a family over for thanksgiving and it was a custom that one of the children would pray for the thanksgiving meal and so it was rollins time to pray for the thanksgiving meal and she looks at her mother and she says mom i don't know what to say and her mom says, well, well, just say what you hear mommy say. So Rollins folds her hands. She closes her eyes really tight. And she bows her head and she says, dear God, I don't know why I invited all these people over here today. <laughs> and maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you have a daughter that that would have been probably said of her. She would have said something like that that day. But recently, I saw in the New York Times Magazine that to this day and age, our adolescents, our teenagers, are more stressed and full of anxiety than ever before. Recently, in a magazine, the National Institute of Health, it says that 38% of girls, 13 to 17, and 28% of boys, 13 to 17, have an anxiety disorder seems that more and more is common with the children, students, and adults. Mental health is a pandemic running through our country today. 26% of adults, one out of every four, that means one out of every four individuals sitting here today, it's very possible that you feel very anxious. And Paul's writing to us and saying, you know what, you don't have to feel that way. You don't have to live in a state of anxiety. But it's real. Anxiety. It's crippling. I've experienced it in my own life. I remember a time in my life that, man, I didn't even want to get out of bed. I just could not get going. My, my life was in such a turmoil and a spin that I just couldn't find my footing. And I found myself feeling very anxious. And the truth of the matter is there are people who sit in church week after week who have given their heart to Jesus Christ and they're saved and they're on their way to heaven but they're constantly in a state, they're, they're handcuffed by a fear, they're handcuffed by anxiety. So today, if we were to take a poll and say, well, why are you anxious? And what's going on in your life that's causing you to have anxiety? Some would say it's, it's health issues. Some of it would, be, would say it's job. Some people would say it's just the stress and worry of the what ifs and what if this happens and what if that happens and who are my, who's my children going to marry and who's my child going to date and all the things that just enwrap us daily, that can create a lot of anxiety, can it? Some would say anxiety comes from indecision. Many of you are in a family. Have you ever asked the question when you have all your family together, hey, where do you want to eat? <laughs> they can't make a decision. Drives me crazy. I'm thankful for a small family. I grew up in a small family and we were all take charge people and, and we didn't spend five, 10 minutes trying to figure out where we're gonna eat. 
Most of you ask that question to your spouse and she'll tell you she wants to go to her favorite restaurant. I don't care. And some of you will try to figure out what is that and where are we going to go. But indecision can create anxiety. Imagination can create anxiety. Isn't it crazy the things that we can come up with in our minds? I mean, we have a hangnail, and the next thing you know, we think we're going to have to have our arm amputated. The imagination, uh, where we can take ourselves, the, the crazy thought past and the patterns, and we're like, where did that come from? Our imagination, some of it, it can come from another word. It can come from imbalance, just the imbalance of life. Just going from one thing to the next. I realized this morning, I came over here to get something. I walked back in my office, and this thing says, you need to calm down. Your heart beats over 100 heartbeats a minute. And I'm like, what, what in the world? This can cause anxiety, right? <laughs> Imbalance. Another I word is isolation. We isolate from people, and we can find ourselves in a state of anxiety. And lately, another I word is inflation. Inflation can create some anxiety in our life, can it? No doubt about it. You see, we live in an age of anxiety. Now, I'm not a conspiracist, but listen to this. It's almost marketed to us through our media that gives us our information. They engage in fear tactics that sell advertising time to pharmaceuticals who are owned by the big conglomerates that will push out information so we can create and design a, a spirit of anxiety. This is what we live in today. Everything we turn and everything we look at, it's one after another, and we can become anxious. But Paul is trying to encourage the church in Philippi, and he's saying, listen, you don't have to be anxious. In fact, be anxious for nothing. One thing I'd like to suggest today is our intake. One thing that creates anxiety in our life is our intake. You see, you can't be filled up with all the culture and all the stress and all the things that are in our, in our society. You can't be filled up and then at the same time pray for the peace of God because there's no room for the peace of God because we're filled to the brim with negativity. We're filled to the brim with criticism. We're filled to the brim with why everything is so so bad and everything's so poor and we can't ask for the peace of God because we don't have room for the peace of God because we're filled up on so much other things. You know, it's funny. God never intended for us to have 24-hour news. God never intended for us to have continuous scrolling, incessant comparing, and an unhealthy focus of oneself. What could happen if we were to take our face out of Facebook and put our face in his book and we would spend more time in his book than we would Facebook? Would our lives be a little less stressed and more, more peace? Is that possible? You see, our text says, be anxious for nothing. A play on words would be this, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. See, we walk around with this 24-hour shock collar in our back pockets, and we're, we're walking, and we get a buzz there, and we get a shock here, and it's all on our tailbone every day. It's, it's called this thing. This can create a lot of anxiety in our life, can it? The phone. How many of you have a phone this morning? Okay, a few of you. Why, in fact, why don't you just take that phone out? I want to show you something. It's a really neat feature on the phone. Why don't you do this? Take Take us on. If you have an iPhone, how many iPhone people do I have? Let's flip our light on and sing We Are the World this morning. Go ahead, get your light out. Get your iPhone on. Seriously, I want everybody to take your phone out. Take it out. Hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. Come on. All my Android, Samsung people, bless your heart. But hey, <laughs> my iPhone people, my iPhone people, go ahead and take it out. There's this really cool feature. In fact, before we do, I show you the cool feature, there's another feature. On the side, there's this little button. And if you click it, your phone will go silent. Because inevitably, every Sunday, someone's phone goes off in here. And I think maybe you do it purposely because you're trying to get Pastor Frank's attention to say, shut it down, bro. Shut it down. But anyway, hey, just go ahead and take your phone out. And you know, if you hold, if you hold both buttons together, this really cool thing happens. This, this, this comes up on the screen. And if you do that, wow. How many of you knew that? Some of you are getting anxiety right now thinking, he's asking me to turn off my phone? No way, I've got to have that phone on. Some of you are like me. If you get 
a, a circle in your phone and it has a, a large number in it, you, you start getting anxious because you've not cleared it out. Some of you, it doesn't bother you. You look and you have like 15,000 emails in that circle. It doesn't bother you. It just That's who you are. And that's fine. It's free country. You can walk around with all those big numbers in the circle. Some of you are like me. You like it that there's no circle there. there there's no number there. The phone can create a lot of anxiety in our life, can it? It's amazing. What technology has brought into our lives. We're more connected than we've ever been, but we're more disconnected than we've ever been. The phone. The phone can create because of intake, constantly taking this and taking that and the negativity. God never intended for us to be connected to 24-hour news. He didn't. He didn't want that for us because he knew that we couldn't handle it. And like I said just a moment, to add insult to injury, some of you have one of these. And it tells you, get up. You need to walk. You've been sitting too long. I need this to say, put the fork down. Don't eat that donut. That's what I needed to say. Stop buying things on Amazon. I need those messages on the... You understand what I'm trying to say? The intake of what we have in our lives. Our lives would be a lot more stressed if we would put the phone down. Be stressful. Stress less. If we could just limit our intake. The intake in our lives creates anxiety. The phone. We get caught up in everyone else's drama. We're caught up in our drama because... We see that this person during the holidays got to go to the Atlantis, and, and we had to go to the Clay County Fair, and we feel like something's not right with that. Like, that's not fair. Or this person got to go to St. John's Town Center and shop, and I had to go to Bucky's and get a T-shirt. Like, I get caught up in all the drama, all the intake. And by the way, what is the deal with Bucky's? Well, there's like an obsession with Bucky's all of a sudden, and People walking around with Bucky shirts. I mean, I know it's pretty crazy. They got 90 gas station or nice, you know, places you can fill your tank up and 60 some odd toilets there. But and, and you can get brisket while you're waiting to fill your car up. I mean, I get it. It's, it's like crazy, right? But what I'm getting at is this, folks. Our intake. What do we fill in our minds with? And the enemy has placed a shot collar on our lives. And he knows he has a strategy. See, we talk about investment strategy. We talk about savings, uh, a savings strategy. We talk about a strategy for this and a strategy for that. The enemy has a strategy. It's to kill. It's to steal. And it's to destroy. To steal, kill, and destroy. And his strategy is this. If he can steal your peace of mind... He can kill your joy, and as a result, he can destroy your thankfulness because you're living with a lot and anxiety. I have a friend that lives in Tampa, and he, he works out continuously. He, he looks like, you know, the Rock Johnson, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. He's just cut and chiseled, and he always say these words to me. He says, Rob, you can't outwork your fork. You can't outwork your fork. You know, what you're putting in... It's taking a, 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 it's taking a part of you. It, it is affecting you. You can't outwork your fork. And the truth would be said to us, folks, and it's God's people. We can't outwork our fork. What we put in is going to come out. And it creates anxiety in our life because of the things that we allow ourselves, the intake of all the negativity and all of the craziness, the toxic. It, it's in our culture today. But Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything but prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Instead of being anxious for no thing, Paul, in other words, is saying this. Worry about nothing and pray about everything. It's been said, worry is the down payment of a problem that may never take place. You just probably like me, you've spent a night tossing, turning, spinning all night long, worrying about something that never even happened. Don't raise your hand, but I know I have. 
no sleep. Sometimes for two and three nights, waking up at two in the morning, staring at the ceiling, trying to figure something out that I'm not even in control of. Folks, do you realize this? We don't even control our heartbeats. We don't even control the air that we breathe. God gives that to us. It's a gift from him. We don't control anything. We're not in control one single iota, nothing. But we worry and we fear and we have anxiety thinking that we are in control. And Paul says, hey, quit worrying about it. Quit thinking about it. Because when we worry, this is what we do. We just spin around. We just spin around. And you know one thing about spinning? When you spin, you always end up where you started. And then you start getting a little dizzy. You just spin. And the truth of the matter is, in this silly illustration, this is some of you today. You're just spinning. Spinning with anxiety, spinning with fear, spinning with worrying about nothing, because it's really nothing. Feels like it's something. You're just spinning. And when we spin, eventually we stop. And when we stop, we can't see clearly, because everything's spinning, and everything's not the way it seems. And the truth of it, some of you, that's you. You're spinning in anxiety. You're spinning in anxiousness. And Paul says that there's a remedy. The remedy is this. If you'll worry about nothing, and if you'll pray about everything, guess what can happen? He says there's something supernatural that takes place in verse 7. He says the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. See, I said earlier that Paul was writing this from a prison cell. He was chained up. I'm sure he was chained to a guard. And as he wrote this, he's probably thinking, well, guard. He's being guarded at this very moment. He's thinking about this six-foot Roman soldier that's got him held up in, in the jailhouse. And I'm sure he was thinking, hey, th that's what happens when I pray about everything and I worry about nothing. Then the peace of God will fill my heart. It will guard me. It will guard my heart and my mind there's something supernatural that takes place when we worry about nothing and we pray about everything. The peace of God comes into our heart. It comes into our life. See, God promises to give us something opposite of anxiety. He promises to give us peace. He gives us peace. I don't know about you, but I can use a little more of God's peace. Because peace brings thankfulness. I can be so much more thankful when my heart is full of peace. But when my heart is full of anxious thoughts and anxiety and fear and all the what ifs, it's hard for me to be thankful. In fact, at my, at my house this Thanksgiving, as we do every year, after we finish eating, we'll go around the room and we'll say something we're thankful about. Just one thing, because we know some people in our family get carried away. And for 30 minutes, they'll talk. Any of you got any family members like that? Okay, don't raise your hand because they may be in. Quit pointing. Don't point. That's not, that's not good. Listen, we'll go around the room and we'll say what we're thankful for. And the point of that is just to pause. Pause. But when I don't have peace in my life, it's hard for me to be thankful. And I'm not being insensitive this morning because some of you are walking through some really difficult storms. I'm not being insensitive because some of you, you don't know where your next paycheck's coming from. You've walked in here today and you don't have much peace. Some of you this week, I'm not being insensitive because you heard from the doctor and they, they used the C word. And your world is just spinning. I'm not being insensitive this morning because some of you are sitting here today and you had someone that you cared for, someone that you thought would always be there with you, someone you thought would always have your back. And they walked out on you this week. And you're saying, Ron, are you kidding me? That God can give me peace in the midst of something of that, some crisis of that in my life? Is that possible? And I would say, yes, he can. And it makes no sense to anyone in your life. They're looking at you like, how are you keeping it together? Like, how is that possible? It 
is. In the first 20 some years of my life, it seemed like everything was doing this. And then I went through a span of about four and a half years, and it just seemed like it was one mountaintop, one valley. One mountaintop, I get over this, and then bam, I could be down here, and then bam, something else good would happen, and then bam, something bad would happen, and something good would happen. It became a roller coaster. I felt like I was in Space Mountain and Disney World, just crazy ride. The truth is, some of you, that's what your life feels like today. You say, Rob, are you serious that, that I can pray about it and God can bring this supernatural peace in my life? Listen, that's the only hope you have. You can't drink it away. You can't take enough pills. You can't smoke enough drugs. There's nothing that you can find in this world because everything is a bubble. You see, if you come out my house today and you see a young child running through the yard and they're chasing bubbles and they catch it and they got this big smile on their face, you're like, oh, yeah, it looks, that's pretty normal. But if you come by my house today and you see me out in the front yard chasing this bubble <laughs> and I got this smile on my face, you're like, he, he needs some, uh, he probably needs some Prozac. There's something wrong with that guy. <laughs> you see, that's what we're all doing. We're chasing bubbles. And we think if we can just get this, then I'll be happy, I'll have peace, I'll be excited. If I could just look like this, if I could just have that chiseled abs, if I could have, these, if I could have all these muscles and not this gut, if I can have this, if I can have this car, if I can impress people at a red light that I don't even know, if I can have all this stuff, I'll have peace, I'll have contentment, I'll have satisfaction. And Paul's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. It doesn't work that way. There's only one thing that brings peace. And that's with a heart of thanksgiving. You're making your request known to God. And he will guard, he will bring that into your life. In the New Testament, in the book of Mark, there's a story of disciples. And they are surviving for their life. In closing, I want to bring out something in this text that I think can help all of us as we think about why am I so anxious? See, I heard this, if all we ever pray about is what we need, and then we never stop to thank God for what we have, we will always be anxious. Did you hear that? If we only pray about what we want and what we need, and we never stop and thank God for what we have, we will always find ourselves in a state of anxiety. In Mark chapter 4, Verses 35 through 41, there's a story. Jesus tells his disciples one day as evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. You say, the other side of what? The Sea of Galilee. In 2010, I had the privilege of, Liz and I actually had the privilege of going to Israel in the Holy Land for, for 10 days. This is a picture. This is a picture of the Sea of, the Ga sea of Galilee. Do you have that? Yes, Sea of Galilee. It's a mountainous sea. Uh, it's, it, it's a lake. It's more of a lake than it is a sea. It, it's about nine miles uh, deep and 13 miles wide. You can be on one side and look straight across the other side. There's another picture, I think. It, it shows um, a sunset. I'm not sure if it's going to come up. But here's the thing. It's in a mountainous region. And it's notorious for storms. Notorious for all of a sudden the, the clouds are, are, you know, blue and there's sun's out and it's peaceful and then all of a sudden like that a storm will come up on you and so the disciples they're crossing over in this boat with jesus the sea of galilee something that they knew about this is the area that they were from many of them had fished the sea of galilee many times they've been caught in storms out in this in their boats fishing time after time but for this reason for this time something was different Look what the Bible says. And leaving the crowd, they took him with him. They're talking about Jesus in the boat, just as he was. And there were other boats with them. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat. Has anyone been out in the sea or in a boat and the waves are crashing in? They're actually coming in the boat and your feet are getting wet. Has that ever happened to anyone in here? Okay, a few of you. You want to talk about panic? You want to talk about fear? That's stressful. 
it's, 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 the waves are coming in the boat. That's what the Bible says. And the boat was already filling. It's filling up with water. But he, talking about Jesus, look at this scripture, was in the stern of the boat. Now, where are my, where are my Navy guys? Where are my Navy guys? Are they out on the front porch? Where's my Navy guys? All right, what's the stern of the boat? Where is that, front or back? Back. So Jesus is in the back of the boat, and look what it says he was doing. He was asleep on a cushion. And they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I don't think they said it like this. Teacher, do you mind to know that we're perishing? I don't think they went back there to wake him up and said, Hey, Jesus, teacher, do you mind that we're perishing? No, no, no. I think there was some excitement. There was fear, anxiety. They were anxious at this moment. Don't you care? And the Bible says that Jesus awoke and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace. Notice the first word he says. Notice the first word Jesus says. Peace. And then he says, be still. And the Bible says that the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? And they were filled with great fear. And they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this? Now they had seen the miracles. They had been there with Jesus. They had seen the people who had been raised from the dead. They had seen the people who had been healed. They had experienced a storm before on the Sea of the Galilee. There's no doubt they're professional fishermen. But why this time were they overcome with great fear, thinking that their life was going to die? And what do they notice? They notice at this time, in this passage, they look in the back of the boat, and this is what they see. They see Jesus bonked out on the back of the boat, sleeping. Now, I've heard when you're working really hard and you got some people standing around you, have you ever found yourself getting frustrated because you're working hard, you're sweating, and you turn around and you see two or three people and they got their hands in their pockets and they're just watching you? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you were just trying your best to just keep it, keep it all together and everybody else around you just seems like life is so good, no problems, they, they just, their bellies are full from brisket from Bucky's, and they're just <laughs> loving life, and your life sucks. Have you ever found yourself getting frustrated with that person? Can't you imagine they may, the disciples were a little frustrated with Jesus because they look back in the back of the boat. Here, they're, they're frantic. The boat's filling with water. Their feet are getting wet. The waves are crashing in on them. They can't see anything, but they turn around and they look, and there's Jesus, the Bible says, asleep on a cushion. Now, if you look in all the four gospels, the other three gospels, you will not find this descriptive measure in any of the other gospels except Mark. Mark pins the word that Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat on a cushion. Every word in the Bible matters. Why would Mark put that phrase in the scripture? What's the significance that Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, lying on a cushion? I'll suggest one thing. Maybe the things that freak us out doesn't freak him out at all. I would suggest the storms in life that cause our emotions and all the anxiety in our life and all the things that are going on that's freaking us out it doesn't freak him out at all so i ask you the question this morning why are you so anxious what's that thing that you think is spinning out of control in your life causing you to stay awake at night Thing that you're worrying and your stress and your fear it's not changing it one bit could it be 
So Jesus is trying to teach us that when our life is raging, he is calm. Could it be that Jesus is trying to teach us in this passage as he's asleep on the cushion while the disciples are frantically fearing for their lives? And Jesus is trying to say, Rob, I got this. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to worry. I got you. Others might have walked out on you, but I'm not going to walk out on you. See, when you have Jesus in your company, when you have Jesus in your boat, you can lie down in the midst of the storm. You can lie down on a cushion, and you can be at peace. See, that's the total opposite of anxiety, isn't it? Because some of you, this has been you. This was you last night. Fluffing your pillow, getting up, walking around, getting a drink of water, coming back in. You can blame it on your husband snoring, but that wasn't it. You were just, this was you. Just anxious for nothing. And Jesus is saying, it doesn't have to be that way. You see, I died on a cross one day, not only to give you eternal life, but I died on the cross one day so you don't have to be handcuffed by anxiety. You don't have to be handcuffed by fear. I said earlier, I get it. Some of you think, oh, you don't understand, Rob. Oh, I, I do. I have flipped and flopped and tossed and woke up the next morning. It looked like me and the covers had went 15 rounds. They were all half off in the floor, and I'm like, what happened last night? Anxiety, anxious, anxious for nothing. See, I think Mark gives us this description just for us to realize this morning. I don't have to be anxious for no thing, but I can have peace when I bring with thanksgiving my petitions to God because he can fill my heart and my life this morning. See, I can't tell you that the storms that God's going to take away are the storms in your life. That would be false gospel. I'm not going to tell you that. But I can promise you that if he's in your boat, you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be anxious. And maybe today your prayer would be this, as I close. Lord, reveal to me why I'm so anxious. Lord, would you show me today, expose the lie that's stealing the thankfulness and the joy in my life? Would you expose the lie? Would you expose the message that's been written on my heart that causes me to always fall in the ditch of anxiety? Would you reveal that to me today? Knowing that you are peace, and when I'm with you, I'm at peace, and when I'm at peace, I find myself to be much more thankful. Give me faith to trust what you say, that your good and your love is good. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you for your word and how it speaks to us. Lord, I hope no one in this room feels like I was being insensitive because of the storm that they find themselves in today. Holy Spirit, speak to them and let them know that in some of the levity and the humor, it was not to not take their situation, their circumstance seriously. God, you care. You love every person in this room today. You love them so much that you gave Jesus a down across for them so they could take, you could take away that sin debt that they have that stamp on their life. Sinner. You replace it with the word redeemed. You loved everyone in this room that much. You also love them that much, not only to give them eternal life, but you also love us enough to give us freedom from anxiety. So this morning, Father, give us faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your way and your love is great. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?